you for visiting our YouTube channel. We hope that the message that you're viewing will be an encouragement, helpful, and a blessing. If you'd like to get additional information about Temple Baptist Church, please visit our website at templebaptch.com. You may also reach us by email at moreinfo at templebaptch.com. Thank you again for watching, and please consider subscribing to our channel to view new messages as they're made available. Thank you. Take the word of God if you would this evening. Be turning back to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter number 11. Joshua chapter 11. And uh, we continue uh, our series uh, considering um, how we are to live victorious Christian lives. Again, as I've said many times already, God desire that we live a victorious Christian life. A life that is enjoyed, not a life that is endured. And we find several principles on how we can live a victorious Christian life in the book of Joshua. Again, crossing the Jordan River is not a sign of death. Uh, it's really a sign of surrender. Uh, we uh, don't uh, die, but we surrender uh, to do the will of God for our life. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. We'll read down through verse number 6. The Word of God says, And it came to pass, when Jabin king of Hazor had heard those things, that he sent to Joab king of Maiden, and the king of uh, Sheron, Shir- and the king of Ashkapat. And the kings uh, that were on the north, on the mountains, and on the plains south of Cheroth, and in the valley, and in the borders of Dor on the west, and to the Canaanites on the east and on the west, and to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites in the mountains, and to the Hivites under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. And when they went out, they and all their host with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude with horses and chariots, very many. When all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Miramon, to fight against Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them. For tomorrow about this time I will deliver them up, all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hoe their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Notice if you would there that expression found in the latter part of verse 6, hoe their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Again, in chapter 10, we saw how that Israel was called upon to defend Gibeon and their victory over the Amorites. Uh, Now Joshua turns his attention to the northern area of Canaan. Uh, The battle for the northern part of Canaan began in the same way that the battle for the southern region began by the initiative of the enemy. The enemy made the first move. The northern powers banded together to start the fight against Israel, but they did not finish the fight. And Joshua and Israel did that. How often is it in the Lord's work, as here in Israel's situation, the enemy tries to stop us before the work begins? So often that's the case. Understand this evening, Satan, the master enemy of God, and his people does not sit idly by waiting for us to do something. Satan tries to disrupt before the work begins. He tries to distract us before we get involved. And he's ever plotting and he's ever planning not only to stop what we're already doing, but also to stop any new work that God may place upon our heart to get involved with. Sometimes, as in the case of the northern kingdoms here, the opposition to a new work can appear so overwhelming that it discourages us from even beginning or starting on our venture for God. If we were to take a, a look at the responsibility and what God has given us to do, 
Uh, if we were to look at that without uh, God's help and look at that in our own strength, we would certainly be overwhelmed. And as we'll see in Joshua's case, in conquering the north, uh, they, they, they faced a very difficult opposition. And it's as easy for God, but, and again, remember this, it's as easy for God to defeat a strong opposition as it is a weak opposition. I want us to consider some thoughts today, and we're going to pray and ask the Lord to help us. And again, keep in mind, we're, we're considering living a victorious Christian life. Sometimes the opposition is so large and so grand that it often distracts us or detour, detours us from living a victorious Christian life. But that's not what God desires. God desires for us to depend upon Him when the opposition is great. You know, God doesn't always move the, remove the giants. Sometimes He wants us to go and fight the giants while He goes with us. And we're going to consider some thoughts this evening. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to work and to speak to our hearts. And as we pray, let's be sensitive to what it is the Lord would have us to do. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and the provisions to live a victorious Christian life. Thank you for your word that helps guide us and direct us uh, and so that we might know how to live this victorious Christian life. Thank you for your spirit that directs us and, and leads us and, Lord, convicts us and, and encourages us. Thank you, again, that we have the privilege and the opportunity to live a victorious Christian life. And Lord, may we not live this life in a way that we just endure it, but Lord, may we enjoy it. Use us this evening for your honor and glory. Lord, we certainly acknowledge the fact we can do nothing without you. Understanding that, we, we must be completely dependent upon you if that which you desire to see accomplished is accomplished. And so Lord, help us to be sensitive to that which you would have us to say. Give us understanding, give us boldness, give us wisdom to... Uh, to pass things or pa uh, to not say things that are not needed. And we'll certainly be grateful for all that you do. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Again, as we begin to look at this, I want us to spend just a little bit of time on considering the setting we find here. Now, before the conflict with the northern nation of Canaan, Scripture here details the setting for us. In the setting, we have the enemy. We have the encampment, and we have words of encouragement. We'll look at these briefly, first considering the enemy. Now to get a good look at the enemy, we noted uh, the head of the enemy and the hearing by the enemy and the host of the enemy. Uh, again, the Bible tells us in verse 1 of chapter 11, And it came to pass when Jabin king of Hazor uh, had heard those things that he sent to Joab king of Maiden, and to the king of Sh Shimron, and to the king of Axaphus. Now Jabin was the head of the northern nations for two reasons. First, he was the one who organized and led the coalition uh, of the northern nations that was formed to combat Israel. Second, the city over which Jabin ruled was the head of all those kingdoms. Go down, if you would, to verse number 10. And Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword. For Hazor before time was the head of all those nations. He was the leader. Now at the time of Joshua's conquering of Canaan, Hazor is believed to have been between 40 and 50,000 citizens or residents. I mean, it's a large city. And when Jabin king of Hazor had heard those things, he took action. What things? How that they had taken care of, of Jericho, how that they had defeated Ai, how that uh, God had uh, used them to defeat uh, the Gibeonites, uh, how that God was using the nation of Israel. And when the king heard these things, he took action to fight against Israel. Now this is, the lee, uh, this is at least six times that the hearing by the Canaanites of Israel's success is mentioned in the book of Joshua. Keep in mind when they sent spies out, Rahab had reminded them, we've heard how God's taking care of you. This is the sixth occurrence in the book of Joshua uh, that Israel's success is mentioned. 
These herd statements, uh, H-E-A-R-D, not H-E-R-D, H-E-A-R-D, these herd statements inform us that God in grace sees to it that all mankind does in some way hear about God and His work. There'll be no excuses when people stand before God that they did not hear. The truth of the matter is even nature itself testifies there's a God in heaven. Nature declares there's a God in heaven. There'll be no excuses offered and there'll be no blame cast on God as someone never heard the truth. The truth is nature itself demonstrates and testifies that there's a God in heaven. Now, all men, again, are given an opportunity to repent. And not only do we see that the enemy had heard, but we also uh, note here the host of the enemy. Jabin put together a large group of people. Mo- uh, most of these individuals were very powerful individuals. More powers uh, were aligned together to oppose Israel in this conflict than any other conflict had in Canaan or anywhere else. I mean, this was a large group of military people that was ready to fight Israel. The northern kingdoms would provide Joshua with the greatest opposition he had ever faced. Now, the first defeat was at Ai, but that was a small city. And the reason there was defeat, because there was sin in the camp. Achan had taken of the accursed things and hid them in his tent. Also, uh, uh, the children of Israel were overconfident. They thought, certainly, if we can see the destruction of Jericho without losing anyone, certainly we don't have to send everybody to go labor against this little place called Ai. They thought they were responsible for the victory at Jericho. They failed to realize God was the one that made victory possible. Now we've considered the enemy here that leads us to consider secondly this evening, the encampment. Notice if you would again in verse number 5. And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Meron to fight against Israel. Now this encampment uh, would be astonishing for Israel to hear about and to behold because the enemy was great in number. Again, notice if you would in verse 4, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude. I mean, that was a whole host of people that came to fight against Israel. They were also great in military might. Again, notice if you would in verse number 4. Not only were they, multi, uh, uh, not only were they numbered uh, as the sand that's upon the seashore in multitude, but notice here, with horses and chariots, very many. Joshua had not faced such a large host or such a strongly armed group of people. He hadn't faced that. Joshua's job doesn't get any easier as he progresses in conquering Canaan. I think sometimes we get the idea in our mind, we, we've seen this great uh, uh, this great uh, victory, this great success, and uh, then things must get easier and things must get simpler. That's not the case at all. As soon as they crossed the Red Sea, they faced Jericho. As soon as they fought Jericho or saw uh, the, the victory at Jericho, then they go and fight a little place called Ai and get beat. And then they go and God helps them defeat Ai, and now they've got to go fight Gibeon. Uh, They're deceived into making an alliance with the enemy. But this was a great task for Joshua. And I said that to say this, in a similar manner, the tests get harder as we progress in the Christian life. And this should not surprise us. uh, As the principle is true in other areas of our life. Let me give you an example. In sports, when a team is battling for the championship, the farther it goes in the tournament, the tougher the opposition is. Because they've gone further in the tournament. Understand, those who do much for the Lord will be fought harder by the devil than those who do less. 
You know, the devil doesn't have to worry about some folks. They're not doing anything for the cause of Christ. And if you want to do much for God, understand this evening, you're going to face very difficult obstacles. But this provides a greater opportunity for God to be glorified. Again, it's not about us, it's all about Him. And the encampment to start the war was located at the waters of Miram. The waters of Miram were located not far from the Jordan and north, and north of the Sea of Galilee. This was a place of great advantage. Water was readily available. They had horses that would need water. They had several people that was involved in this uh, uh, military advancement. They would need something to drink. And again, the water was an essential here. Secondly, if you have a Bible atlas, I would encourage you to look it up sometime, but it was an advantageous uh, as far as the terrain is concerned. The ground was level. It would be difficult to take chariots up a, an, an incline. But the ground was level. The chariots being there tells us that the chariots uh, uh, were going to be used effectively on the ground. And again, the ground needed to be level. Understand this evening, Satan wants to manipulate things so that he can gain an advantage over us. You see, while Joshua had to combat the enemy at this particular place, it doesn't take away from the fact that Christians ought to avoid places which are particularly advantageous to Satan. There are some places a Christian has no business being in. There are some activities that a Christian has no business being involved in. Now, there's a good time to say amen. Why? Because Satan can gain an advantage. And a Christian has no business being around a place that Satan can gain an advantage. Dens of iniquity give the devil great advantage in attacking pe people. And we, don't, we need not let the devil have any more advantage than he already has. He's, set, he's got several tools at his disposal. We, the Bible refers to them as the wiles of the devil, those tricks that he uses and devices. We don't need to give the devil any more advantage than he already has. Now that leads us to consider one final thought this evening. Again, we've considered tonight the encampment. We've considered this evening the, the setting there. But I want us to consider lastly the encouragement. With this great multitude of enemies encamped at the waters of Miron, things look very difficult, things look very dangerous for Joshua and the children of Israel. However, God countered the enemy's appearance with a word of encouragement for Joshua. The encouragement gave Joshua two things. It involved a promise, and it involved a prerequisite. As you study Scripture, most of the promises of God have attached to them a prerequisite. You have not because what? You ask not. We've got to ask. We trust God for our salvation, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Most of the promises in God's Word involve a prerequisite. That's something that's very common. God's promises often come with a prerequisite attached to them. Now we're going to consider, first of all, the promise tonight. The promise is found in verse number 6. The word of God said, and the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them. For tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. Thou shalt, not, uh, thou, uh, thou shalt hoe their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Now what an encouraging promise 
Joshua receives from God. It's said that within the next 24 hours, uh, uh, the vast host of the enemy, the army, the opposition, uh, which uh, presented such a great problem would be no more. Understand this evening, God's enemies are not as secure as they think. There's a lot of people that boast and brag. There's a lot of people that deny the existence of God. And many of those individuals think within their mind and within their heart, they're invincible. But I again remind us this evening, God's enemy are, uh, enemies are not as secure as they think, and God's people are not as helpless as they often think. I mean, it's, it's troubling to me, I'll just be honest with you. It's troubling to me to see the mindset of many today. I mean, we just limp along as if God's dead. We, we drag our feet as if God has lost His ability to take care of us and that God can provide for our every need. I want you to understand this evening, as a believer this evening, with God's help, all things are possible. We're not as helpless as we often think. Now we note here not only the promise, but also note here the prerequisite. God ordered Joshua to do something. God gave Joshua the promise in verse 6, but he also included in verse 6 the prerequisite. Now here's what God told Joshua to do. Thou shalt hoe their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Now to hoe, that's a, it's a unique word, we don't use that very often. But that would be to hamstring, it literally meant to cut the tendon behind the hoof of the horse. And that would render that horse useless as that tendon would never grow back together. Now we can understand why the horses and chariots were destroyed as far as the enemy was concerned. It took away their ability to fight with those weapons and those horses. Now you may be thinking and asking yourself the question tonight, why didn't God want Israel to capture the horses and to capture the chariots? Turn over, if you would, to Psalms chapter 20. And I'll give a quick answer while you're turning there. God knows us pretty well. And does he not? Notice what it says in verse 7 of Psalms chapter 20. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Understand this evening the destruction of these tools and weapons of war were to occur so that Israel would not put their trust in those things, but they would trust God in the future. Let me ask this evening, what is it we're trusting in tonight? Are we trusting in our ability? Are we trusting in our ability to think? Our ability to work? Are we trusting in our strength? Or are we trusting in the Lord? By the destruction of those chariots, the burning of those chariots, and rendering those horses basically useless, Israel could not depend on those horses and chariots. Understand, horses and chariots were things men had a tendency to trust more than God in a time of war. And God was going to keep Israel from trusting in those things. Sometimes God must destroy and God must empty us of impressive helps so that He can get the glory 
and we'll trust Him. Now, we don't like that. As a matter of fact, we, we despise that. But God, at times, must empty us of the impressive helps so that we'll trust Him more fully. You see, Joshua led the Israelites in a very successful attack upon the northern powers of the land of Canaan. The Lord delivered those nations into the hand of Israel. Notice if you would in verse 8. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel who smote them and chased them. Note there the last part of that verse. And they smote them until they left them none remaining. How is that possible? I mean, there's a multitude of people there. Joshua didn't have a whole lot of folks. He didn't have the numbers that uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the enemies had. Joshua didn't have the horses. He didn't have the chariots the enemy had. How was it possible to uh, have such a great victory? God made it possible. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel who smote them and chased them. And they smote them until they left them, left them none remaining. God helped Israel in this battle. And I said that to say this. We are living in wicked days. Amen? We're living in wicked days. Evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. I read today that one of the, uh, the mayor of L.A. is threatening to cut off the electric and water from churches that are still meeting. That's a vile, wicked man. By the way, if the bill's paid, they can't do that legally. Amen? I'm telling you, it's coming to the point in time people are going to have to raise, rise up and say, enough's enough. You've perjured yourself in stating you would uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. You boldface lied when you put your hand on a Bible. And if you or I perjured ourselves in court, we'd be thrown in jail. That's where they belong. They're boldface liars. And for a mayor to stand up and say, we're going to cut the power and cut the water off of any church that's meeting is a heretic, a heathen. Now the last seven verses of Joshua chapter 11 here gives us a summary of Joshua conquering the land. You see, the summary not only includes the northern part of Canaan, but it also included the other areas of Canaan. And when Joshua conquered the northern part, he finished the main work of conquering Canaan. It's interesting, the first and the last verse of this summary paragraph contain nearly identical statements that sum up the conquering work that Joshua enjoyed. Notice, if you would, in verse 16. So Joshua took all that land, the hills and all the southern country and all the land of Goshen and the valley and the plain and the mountain of Israel and the valley of the same. Notice if you would in verse 23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. And the land rested from war. Now it's interesting here, as you read these two verses, we have a word that's repeated. It's the word so, S-O. These two so statements, with the two so statements in verse 15, we discover here the reason that Joshua was successful and Joshua was able to conquer the land. Why? Notice if you would in verse 15, here's why. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua. And so did Joshua. 
He left nothing undone of all the Lord commanded Moses. Now understand this evening, the reason we read that word so in verse 16 and verse number 23 is because of the two so's we read in verse 15. Joshua did what God commanded him to do. Understand this evening as we close, true success is always dependent of, upon our obeying the Word of God. Joshua's life emphasizes that truth. You want to live a victorious Christian life? Then obey the Word of God. You want to be miserable as a Christian? Disobey the Word of God. Some of the most miserable people I know are backslidden Christians. Brother Coger can testify to that probably better so than I can. Some of the most miserable people, some of the most cantankerous people, some of the, most, some of the people that's the hardest to be around are backslidden Christians. They're not enjoying the Christian life. They're not living a victorious Christian life. They're enduring the Christian life. And the reason they're not enjoying is because they're disobedient. True success is always dependent on obeying the Word of God. Let me ask this evening. I'm finished. Are we living a victorious Christian life? We have no excuse not to. God has equipped us with everything we need. He's given us His Word. To guide us and to direct us. He's given us His Spirit. To guide us and to direct us. There's not an individual in this auditorium tonight, nor is there an individual that's watching the live stream this evening that could not and cannot live the victorious Christian life. We don't have to live defeated lives. We can live a victorious Christian life. We can enjoy the Christian life. True success is always dependent on our obeying the Word of God. Are we successful tonight? Are we successfully living the victorious Christian life? Are we enjoying the Christian life or are we enduring the Christian life? You say the enemy's large. The enemy is large, but God's greater. The enemy doesn't have more power than God. Sometimes we see the size of the enemy and we fail to see the size of God. God's able. God's promised. He'll take care of us. He's promised never to leave us nor forsake us. He's promised to supply all of our needs according to His riches, not ours. I'm glad He didn't depend upon ours. God's able to take care of us. Are we living the victorious Christian life? Do we have a desire to live the victorious Christian life? We can be successful in that as we obey God's Word. May we understand the necessity of obedience. There's a lot of people trying to do things that do not line up with the Word of God. I mean, they spout off Scripture, but they don't live it. That's either amen or oh me. Satan can spout off Scripture. Amen. He's done it before. Don't spout off Scripture if you ain't willing to live it. That's either amen or oh me. A person that spouts off Scripture is no different than Satan. Live it. You want to be successful? Obey the Word of God. You want to be miserable? Disobey the book. It's pretty simple. I'm grateful that it is. God told Joshua, I'm going to, you're going to be successful. Here's what I want you to do. Just to make certain that you don't depend on the wrong thing, I want you to go over there and I want you to make those horses useless. I want you to burn those chariots with fire. 
You say, why would that? Just as certain as they had captured those things, they would started using them thinking that was a reason for victory. They're no different than us either. Amen. When are we going to realize without God we can do nothing? He guarantees success. Let's bow our heads.